Welcome back Preventers. So in this video I'll be talking about part 2 of my video about vitamin D, vitamin K2 and COVID. Initially I planned this to be a two part video uh, and which I will then upload later into a full presentation. However there's more information on this topic than I originally thought. So uh, as such this might turn out to be a three part or four part video where in the third part I'll talk about vitamin D and its effect on COVID and in part four probably around vitamin K2, vitamin D and COVID and then I will upload the entire presentation in one take uh, for people to watch and may, uh, see how it all makes sense all together. Uh, but for now I'll continue where I left off on the previous presentation. Uh, and talk about what about infection because that umbrella review actually didn't talk uh, very much uh, about vitamin D's role in infection. And uh, what better place to start us off than by going back to 1918 during the influenza pandemic and uh, where people got very sick during about a pandemic strain of influenza. And as you can see, a lot of patients were outside and during this open air hospital. Uh, getting this type of treatment uh, of getting a lot of sunshine and a lot of fresh air. Now, uh, this uh, now why would this be, you ask? Well, uh, let us go into detail on this. So, as you can see, during the 1918 influenza pandemic, which was also called the Spanish flu, it was a worldwide pandemic, just like COVID is now but its mortality rate was much higher. It claimed the lives of 50 million people in 1918. Why, uh, why as by comparison, COVID has claimed the lives of around 5 million casualties as of the posting date of this video. And the treatment for these people getting sick with uh, the influenza pandemic was getting plenty of air and sunshine. And as you can see, they're being monitored by nurses and by doctors on the premises. And uh, lots of open air hospitals were constructed across the country. However, it's difficult to find uh, uh, records or complete records uh, of these hospitals. But uh, one very well described example is Camp Brooks Open Air Hospital. And this hospital was constructed uh, uh, in, the sept in September of 1918. And this was at Quarry Hill in Brookline near Boston. And uh, as you can see for these uh, patients, Treatment consisted of maximum sunlight and fresh air for them. Uh, and using this method, mortality rates fell from 40% to 13%. And these doctors also noticed that by just having the uh, treatment of basically uh, sunlight and fresh air, that most of them uh, did, uh, required minimal medication in order to get better and get over the influenza pandemic. So uh, the Surgeon General of the Massachusetts Guard, William A. Brooks, uh, on talking about uh, Camp Brooks Open Air Hospital, said that the efficacy of open air treatment has been absolutely proven and one has only to try it to discover its value. And this was by William A. Brooks here, as you can see over here. And well, why would this be? Why would putting patients in, in basically the sun and with the fresh air uh, make them better. A possible explanation is vitamin D. Vitamin D, uh, as I've shown you before, has uh, many positive benefits and it's made when UV light actually hits your skin and then vitamin D is hydroxylated in your liver and then your kidney, uh, which helps make 25 hydroxy vitamin D3, which has a lot of positive benefits. But in addition to those benefits are its possible role with an infection. So if if it actually does have a role in infection, then this would make sense that people exposed to ultraviolet light made vitamin D, which helped the immune response and helped them get over the influence of pandemic virus. But uh, there is also the alternative hypothesis, but that uh, the fresh air also uh, helped the patients get better or perhaps the environment also helped the, uh, helped the uh, patients get better. This was when the 40% mortality was when uh, comparing them to closed air hospitals like a typical hospital compared to an open air hospital and the mortality rate was reduced from 40% to 13% using this open air hospital compared to the closed rate hospital, uh, closed hospital. So uh, did the people in 1918 even know about the existence of vitamin D at the time? Well, if you look about the timeline, 
Uh, Spanish flu happened in 1918, and Camp Brook opens on September 9, 1918. But vitamin D2, the chemical structure uh, of vitamin D, so there are two forms of vitamin D. There's vitamin D2 and D3. Uh, they're both basically vitamin D. And uh, this chemical structure was only discovered in 1932 by Askew et al. So during the Spanish flu, uh, Spanish flu, there were... Uh, the people did not even know about vitamin D at this time, but they discovered that by putting patients in sunlight and fresh air, this helped to reduce mortality. So will we ever know that vitamin D was the thing that caused, uh, the, caused the patients to have reduced mortality and to overcome this virus? We will probably never know. Uh, we will probably never know because we don't really have any serum tests of vitamin D, nor do we have any manufactured vitamin D to give patients and see in a retrospective analysis if they actually get better and see if this was potentially caused by the vitamin D. But what about the information that we do know now? Well, we do uh, know about vitamin D's uh, basically infl um, role on basically the immune system on upper respiratory tract infections. So what are upper respiratory tract infections? Well, you're probably very familiar with them. It's when you have like a sore, uh, when you have a cough, when you have a sore throat, and when you just generally feel under the weather or when you feel just pretty bad and you feel sick. That is also called malaise. So uh, in this very, in this paper, they uh, include a very nice uh, study about vitamin D supplementation to prevent acute respiratory tract infections, which was a systemic review and meta-analysis of individual participant data. So this is the highest form of evidence that we have. The meta-analysis and systematic reviews are the highest form of evidence. And this was the BMJ in 2017. So uh, what kind of studies did they look at? They looked at 38 randomized controlled trials with a total sample size of 10,933. And they see uh, they didn't enter. Uh, they look to see if vitamin D supplementation, either in the form of D3 or D2, compared to participants randomized to a group not getting vitamin D, did it reduce the risk of an upper respiratory tract infection. So this is their force plot and their meta analysis of the data. In my previous video, I I mentioned how to read a force plot, but I'll go over it again. So on the left, this favors the intervention. On the right, this favors the control. This is the line of non-significance. So if the confidence interval, well, the confidence interval is the, basically the plus and minus value about how certain the researchers are about where the effect of their result lies. So if this confidence interval crosses one, then this means that the... Uh, uh, experimental treatment or the intervention basically had no role in the outcome. So, for uh, example, uh, they had control intervention study, odds ratio, and statistics over here. So, if the vitamin D did not reduce the incidence of an up uh, upper respiratory tract infection, then uh, this confidence interval would cross one, and then it would have no effect on upper respiratory tract infections. But if it is on the left-hand side, then it means that with vitamin D supplementation, this reduces the incidence of, our, of upper respiratory tract infections. And if it crosses the line of non-significance, then uh, it has no effect. And if it's on the right-hand side, then this means that vitamin D supplementation increased, uh, increased the amount of upper respiratory tract infections. So as you can see, most of these re study results lie on the left-hand side. There are some that cross basically the line of non-significance and their effect is kind of near the middle and no role, but some of them do have left and then the researchers were able to tabulate all of these results. And basically through statistics, through statistics, they were able to come up with an overall value about the effect of vitamin D on the incidence of upper respiratory tract infections. And as you can see over here, it's on the left-hand side, with me, which means that vitamin D supplementation did reduce the incidence of upper respiratory tract infections. And it's a triangle because the triangle is just used to denote that it's different from the squares. 
and uh, basically the slower and higher point uh, uh, signify the confidence interval. And as you can see, this confidence interval does not touch one. So this means that it was significant and it did reduce the amount of upper respiratory tract infections. So if once again, we look at the results, they found that vitamin D supplementation reduces the risk of uh, an acute respiratory tract infection among all participants. So as you can see, uh, the confidence interval was 0 0.81 to 0 0.96. So it does not cross one. So it's on the left-hand side. Vitamin D supplementation reduced the incidence of an upper respiratory tract infection. And the probability was less than 0 0.01. So in statistics, if anything, uh, in basically uh, medical research, if anything, uh, if most of the time, if its probability is less than 0 0.05 or 5%, this means that the results were unlikely to be due to chance and you can accept them with confidence. So, and then the researchers also uh, on the on the data that they had, they also put additional analysis and they found out that the protective effects were stronger in those who had less than 25 nanomoles per liter at baseline and then given supplementation compared to people who had over 25 nanomoles per liter of vitamin D through serum 25-hydroxy vitamin D. So this means that the people that had the least amount of vitamin D uh, in, in basically their serum or in their blood or in their plasma, uh, they, they had uh, more benefit than people who already had some vitamin D uh, basically in their blood, in their plasma, in their serum. Uh, and these protective effects were seen the most in those taking daily or weekly dose doses, but not bolus doses. Bolus doses are, for example, if you take 300,000 units of vitamin D every three months or 100,000 units of vitamin D every month. These protective effects were seen in those taking daily or weekly doses of vitamin D supplementation, but not in the bolus doses. So how does this uh, all, like, how does, what is the role of vitamin D in COVID? Well, this will be covered in my part three of my video, where we'll talk about how it be in COVID. And probably in part four, I'll talk about how vitamin D and vitamin K2 uh, work together to give a maximum benefit and safety. And also, and also how they can help and what is the mechanism by which that they can help to reduce uh, COVID burden and the burden associated with this disease.